Bloom, Buddhist Reflections on Serenity and Love by Ajahn Sona. Chapter 17 Opening the Eye People will wonder what happened to you when you come back, speaking fluent Pali and hugging everybody on the sidewalk. The summer of love has returned. To pull together what we've been at for the week, I just want to talk a little bit about the Eightfold Path in general. In a retreat, you get to reduce the amount of talking, and whatever conversations come up are usually refined and positive, just enjoying each other's company. This is the background, the preliminaries. You've purified the preliminary structures of virtue through right speech, moderate speech, and silence. And during this time, you're engaged in right action as well. You're being merciful to the beings around you and, of course, participating generously with chores and helping in the kitchen. These are generally uplifting types of behavior, characteristic of retreats in monasteries. Everybody's usually on their best behavior, providing a background preliminary for beginning the path. We get a chance to have a supported environment for the upper three factors of this path. Outside of here, I know you're in the midst of life, working and going to school, dealing with all the multiple layers of demand that the modern world makes on you. But when you find your way to a formal retreat, you get a little envelope package moving you out of this. Of course, nine or ten days is not very long, really. As I mentioned, the first three days, you're hardly here. When you finally get here, you may sometimes experience dryness or aching knees. You might forget what it is you're supposed to be doing or have trouble sleeping. And then, suddenly, you're near the end. Perhaps, though, you touched on something, somewhere along the line, even for a few hours. Or on a certain day, you relaxed and felt peaceful. Peaceful but not tired, energized, happy, just content. This is touching on the beautiful. The Buddha is trying to structure an information pack that leads you there, that leads you to a sense of ease and contentment, which is what everybody, every human, wants. They don't know that quite often. They try to get it in very unskillful ways. But that is ultimately what they want, resolution. They want to finally feel that sense of simplicity and contentment and ease, that there's nothing more they could ask for. It doesn't take much. As long as you have enough food and water, that's about it. Sometimes I felt very content even though I didn't have enough food. That's possible with almost no special environment. If you come close to that, then it's beautiful, and it's too bad you would not have another month or so just to drop deeper into that, for it to become the new normal. That's ultimately where you want to go. The mind seems to have levels. It has a certain level of demand for sensory stimulation requirements that it's used to, and it won't give up its accustomed level of activity for a little while. If you withdraw from those things, it wonders what you're up to, but eventually it will surrender and it will drop to the next level, the new level, the new normal, and you'll feel that. Perhaps in the retreat you felt at some point that you dropped into a new normal, an absence of sound, and it was just fine. Then the idea of sitting still for an hour or two seemed to be perfectly adequate. You're going to go through a number of these levels, and pretty soon you reach a new neighborhood, a very good neighborhood. You're starting to get close to samadhi. In fact, as you're walking around, if you're in a mood of contentment, you're feeling joy, you've enjoyed your friends, you've enjoyed the atmosphere, and started to settle down, it's a type of samadhi, the edge of samadhi. Samadhi is a very beautiful thing, It's alive. It's full of wisdom. I've emphasized a few times that you shouldn't sharply divide wisdom and insight off from samadhi. Samadhi has content to it, 
has all kinds of sophisticated mental structures to it that are the embodiment or facsimiles of profound wisdom. My original ordaining teacher was Bhante Gunaratana. He's been teaching for probably 50 years, giving retreats and so forth, and he almost always ends every session with this quote from the Buddha, There is no jhana without wisdom, no wisdom without jhana. But one who has both jhana and wisdom is close to nibbana, to peace. In his own life and experience, he has recognized that people tend to separate these two things out. There's been a tradition of separating wisdom, panya, from serenity, jhana or samadhi. The word concentration sometimes can induce a sense of tension, like being at school, concentrating, doing things you don't want to do. Samadhi is a very beautiful word, indicating balance and serenity. Your emotional dimension and your intellectual faculties are balanced and harmonious, finally working the way they should. All the gears are properly meshed. It's a profoundly beautiful experience to have the body and the mind integrated, working the way they should. How do you know they're working the way they should? Because it feels like it. If you have to ask too much about how your practice is going, it's probably not going well enough. It could be better. Usually you don't have to be told that you're having fun, that you're having a beautiful experience. You won't need to ask, am I having a beautiful experience? You will know. Otherwise, it's not beautiful enough. If you have to ask, keep going. There is integration of serenity and wisdom. They're not in any sense of opposition. They stand supporting and intertwined with each other. We've been talking through the week about loving kindness and joy and energy. These are all profound supports for the insight into the transience of our life, that our life is going by like a dream. Each day is just flipping over a page in a book. It's just that fast, and the day is completely gone, absolutely gone, mysteriously. How does it happen? Time and its passage are such mysteries. What is the past? Whole books are written on this. What is it? Does it exist at all? Is there a future somewhere in the slipstream of time? It's a beautiful mystery, and you really can't stabilize any of it. You can't get security, ultimately, except by relaxing. The best you can do is to feel secure. You can never actually get secure, but you might as well feel secure. If you feel secure, it's as good as being secure. In fact, nothing else will do. Being secure but not feeling secure, you might as well not be secure. This is relaxing in the midst of total uncertainty, of not being able to ever know for sure how it's going to be. This is the struggle, the not wanting that to be, the not liking that to be. The truth of uncertainty arising every now and then is what causes the problems. But if we just lie down in it and turn towards it and go swimming in the stream of time and the unpredictability of the future and the incomprehensibility of the past as well, if we're not afraid of it, we will feel secure. When I ask you to tell me your story, who you are, you will only pick out one-tenth of one percent of your life And you might arrange that as the representation of who you are, what you've done, and so forth. But it's only a tiny percentage of the thousands, the billions of thoughts that you've had and all the motions of the body. When people describe their life, they choose things like, I owned a motorcycle store. I'm a businessman. That's just one of the things you do. Others might describe themselves as sleepers. I'm a sleeper. I sleep eight hours a day. There was a French artist who was asked, what do you do? He said, I'm a breather. I do a lot of breathing. Yeah, mostly breathing. It's true. 
of all the activities that we do, we could certainly say that we mostly breathe. How we choose to define ourselves in the past is just arbitrary. It's a story, emphasizing one thing but not another. Why this and not that? Maybe you repeated a whole series of things, or maybe one moment was spectacular. Maybe it was spectacularly bad, or it could be spectacularly good. Which one are you going to choose? Moments, or repetitions, or unconsciousness, or dullness? It's just arbitrary. There's nothing to grasp. The past is incomprehensible. The future's unpredictable. This is the way it is. The Buddha is saying that this complex human mind that can understand the ideas of future and past can also experience some unfortunate effects as a result of that if it's not handled well, if we're not given the proper instruction. Neither at the time of the Buddha, nor certainly to this day, is it ever fully explained to us how to manage being alive as a human. We're trained to do jobs, We're scheduled for this and that. We have arbitrary information. We read all kinds of books about people's lives. You read a book about somebody you really know and you think, well, maybe it went that way. Or you read an article where someone writes something about you. It's very fascinating, but that's not the way it was. The Buddha is summarizing it for you because this is the most important information you're going to have in your life. How to manage this thing called time, which is a product of your mind. Your life is a product of your mind. When we talk about your life, we're actually talking about the thought processes. Your life is nothing but the thought processes. We can manipulate them. We can do incredible things with those thought processes, with very simple technology. The Buddha gives you the technologies. He says, try this. Try watching your breath. Notice the breathing. Notice the lovely, light, airy quality of this. Ride away into that airy quality. Allow the sense of the body to drift away. Do you start to see that your body is really a product of the mind? You see that as you change your mind, your whole experience of your body changes. As you change your mind, your whole experience of your relationships to others changes. As you change your mind, as you do these techniques, how you regard your past changes. The future changes. You start to understand that from a certain point of view, You can transform the very world you live in. The very structure of reality depends on the careful use of the mind. The Buddha is saying, don't chase around out there. You're the source. It's in your mind. Turn towards the mind. All you need is just a fairly quiet environment and a handful of techniques, spiritual exercises to take along with you. Then he briefly explains the impediments to the good life. What is it that ruins our life? What is it that mildly distresses us? What can lead to profound problems? Only these three things, aversion and desire and confusion. What can you do about that? First, just listen to that idea and realize that these three things are the source of the problem. Don't ignore that. That's the arising of wisdom. Secondly, to find out what you can do about these things, he says, you can take just a handful, just a few teachings. The most problematic emotion, the one that hurts the most, is hostility, anger, aversion in all its forms. But the Buddha, with a very kindly smile, says, Don't you worry. That's the easiest one to get rid of. Aversion is easy to get rid of, mostly because it feels so bad. You're all ears when it comes to freeing yourself of bad feelings, unpleasant experiences. 
First of all, you may not realize that you have an option. You don't have to actually critique everything. You don't have to have an opinion about everything. Everything you see, everything you hear, everything you smell and taste and touch, everything you think. It's very common for people to keep asking themselves, what's wrong with that? Is that good or is that bad? That habitual process of looking for the fault is where your suffering lies. So realize that you don't have to have an opinion about these things. Let sights be sights, let sounds be sounds, smells, tastes, touches. Let the flow of thought just be that. Don't invest in it. Just allow that world to be and realize you're off the hook. You don't have to have an opinion about everything. You don't have to comment on everything. It's just as it is. It's way too much work to have an opinion about everything. That's the withdrawal from the source of hostility, the unwise focus on the fault. The unwise focus on the fault of you, of your life, of your future, of the people around you, of societies, of political systems, of thought systems, of the weather, of everything. The Buddha just says, don't go there. Just bring the mind back, say, stop that. See if you can just walk through the day without your mind fixing on the fault of a sight, a sound, smell, taste, or touch. Then you have a lot more time. You'll find yourself a lot less stressed and with an incredible sense of freedom. You'll feel, I'm off the hook. Could it really be possible I'm allowed to walk through life like this? Is it true I really don't have to wear ruts in my cortex anymore? Am I allowed to do this? Yes, you are. And then you've set yourself up for something really beautiful. By the way, you might be asking, am I allowed to have a beautiful experience? Shouldn't I have to pay for it? Maybe there's only a few people allowed to have this. But am I one of them? Is an ordinary person without any qualifications allowed to have a beautiful experience? Without winning the Nobel Prize or being first in my class or making a lot of money? Am I allowed to? The Buddha says, yeah, you got to get past that one. Don't even think about whether you should or shouldn't, whether you're deserving of it or not, whether you're worthy or not. You're not in any position to have an opinion on it. Just find out. If you have a beautiful experience, you can have a beautiful experience. Go toward that beautiful experience. Love, friendliness, wonderful. To be with your friends, and even just one truly good friend, what a beautiful experience. You always want to go back to it. You never get tired of your friend. You don't get tired of friendliness. It never wears out. He says, now that you've stopped squandering your energy and creating distress, you don't get tired of friendliness. It never wears out. He says, now that you've stopped squandering your energy and creating distress, that painful feeling of harsh, critical, endless fault-finding, when you dispense with that, you've set yourself up for the possibility of the opposite, the very, very beautiful. When you look out on things, you look out radiating this pleasant feeling. The world, then, is just a backdrop for the feeling. And remember, it has nothing to do with assessment. There's no intellectual operation here. You're not asking whether anybody deserves this or not. You're not asking whether they're wonderful beings or cute or entertaining. No, don't care. That's just a backdrop for indiscriminately enjoying this feeling. This is radically different from the way we think. There's no transaction involved. No, he says, that's the mystical thing. It's just there. It's available. It's produced by you with no stringent requirements. Nobody has to be especially wonderful or anything. It's just available to you. 
Let it radiate out and enjoy that. This is the Buddha's prescription. Or you can have a confused and difficult life, and most people do. Or you can do this and drop tons of this distress. Days and weeks and months and years of distress. You can drop it. This is, again, the most troubling of the emotions, this aversive stuff. It happens because you commit yourself to finding fault with everything, and it produces this suffering and distress. The second problem, desire, is less troubling. You want things. You want beautiful things. You want beautiful people, beautiful teacups. You want a beautiful house, beautiful weather. You want to be beautiful. You want. And the Buddha says, well, this is not so bad, actually, but it's still a problem. It leaves you in debt, as in the modern sense of credit card debt. You always have to pay. Wanting the beautiful puts you instantly into debt. The moment you want it, you're in debt. Why are you in debt? Because you don't have it. And until you get it, you refuse to be happy. You're saying, if I had that, I would be happy. So therefore, if I don't have that, I'm not allowed to be happy. I won't be fully happy. I must not be happy. Only that would make me happy. So you just pulled a trick on yourself. Very, very fast. You just created a sense of lack. And that's the problem with desire. This is hard to get rid of, actually. The anger thing is much easier. You can get rid of that. The desire is hard to get rid of because the moment when you get the thing, there's this little celebration. It lasts for a little while. You actually enjoy it for a little while. But then you're on to the next thing. And also, you can have a bit of joy with the anticipation of getting the thing. It's coming tomorrow. Next week, next year, there's a certain anticipatory joy. Desire is accompanied sometimes by pleasant feelings, and so it's famously tricky to see through that. First of all, explain it fully to yourself. What's wrong with this? What's the problem about these things that are quite nice? I've had some, and then it wore out, or my interest in it wore out and it's dead to me now. You start to see how the story goes. You're never finally satisfied. There is always the phrase, and then what? Once you run it through in the long term, you just see that this never goes to the place you want it to get to. There are moments of pleasure along the way, but ultimately it never goes to where I want to be. I'm never finally content. I never finally find that beautiful experience, that beautiful sense of contentment, which overflows and is just on the edge of an ecstatic experience. It's not too dramatically ecstatic, but even better than dramatic ecstasy, it's subtle ecstasy. This is the experience of a human at peace. A human at peace is one of the great miracles. It lasts a minute or 30 seconds or an hour, or in the case of some very fortunate, wise people, it lasts almost indefinitely. The idea of a human content and at peace just makes everything pale in comparison. We can get a taste of that through metta as well. We're using a little bit of wisdom to reflect on how anger arises, using a little bit of wisdom to reflect on the problematic nature of desire, and we're using practice and imagination and memory to try to induce the experience of contentment and overflowing friendliness so that we get a taste of it. It's a very addictive taste. Everything else drops into the background you start to lose interest in those other things. That can be a little bit alarming, but it's natural. The other stuff 
doesn't hold up by comparison to moments of well-being, even a few moments. What was that? That was wonderful. We want to induce these through serenity and some wisdom. It's not enlightenment, but you're going in the right direction. So this is a small handful of things that you take along. The other is to ask yourself, how much time do I have, by the way? Is this a hobby? You know it's true. People do die. But when? Very uncertain. It's good every now and then to reflect on that. This should not induce any kind of fear or despair or anything like that. There should be no anxiety around this. If it does, then you're holding it wrongly. And you have to go back and just find the breath, find metta. Until you can hold this idea of the brevity of your life and the uncertainty of its duration and the duration of your health as well as a precious motivator. It just says, you know, I really need to make a move now. Life is precious. It's short. It's very uncertain. And if I'm ever going to taste any of this wonderful stuff, I should get on with it. It is a priority in life. It's not about quantity of life or the mere prosaic stuff of life. You have to interrupt yourself and say, I've heard about this stuff. Is it possible to experience it? How would I do that? Get your priorities straight with this little handful of things. Understand the fault, the problem of fault finding. Understand the downside of craving and desire. Find alternative food which has no downside, such as metta, such as the breath, such as the fresh restorative properties of stopping all this endless thinking, this endless inner chatter, the endless story. These are the simple tools by which you do this. You clear the mind of the story through the breath. You clear the mind of negative emotions through metta. Then, you set yourself up for this integration of serenity, this calmness, and the opening of the eye. You see how to conduct yourself. That's what Dhamma is. What's my relationship to reality, my relationship to my life? That's the insight. I'm in a proper relationship with the facts of time, of the ungraspable nature of things. I've grown up. I'm no longer childishly trying to grab things that just melt in my hands. This is the awakening of wisdom. You're in tune with the way things really are. It's not a distressing realization. It's a wonderful realization. And it never goes away. You can't lose it. The circumstances will never be such that it's inappropriate. It's always the right thing in all circumstances. When things are going well, you don't forget reality, and so the rug never gets pulled out from underneath you. And when things are going badly, you never forget reality. You don't get lost in it. You say, it's just part of the dream. It flows away. Change happens. Can you remember that, though? The memory is a difficult thing because it's associated with feeling. When you have a feeling, that calm, centered feeling, then you will remember the truth. When you don't have that feeling, you can't remember the truth. You can't remember how it is because it's not accompanied by feeling. Memory and feeling are intertwined. If you don't have the feeling, the magic can't happen. You can't recapture reality. That's why we work with the feelings trying to bring up such things as loving-kindness. Then you remember what it is, how amazing this human experience is, and how tricky it is to be a human, how tricky it is for everybody. You become very forgiving. You understand that it's so easy to go off the tracks. That feeling restores your memory and your wisdom. Loving-kindness is a basis for wisdom. The feeling brings you back to the proper balanced picture of things, not exaggerating the faults of others, not exaggerating the beauty of things. 
but a sane and balanced appreciation of just how things really are. You'll say things much differently. If you set yourself up in the feeling, your speech when you talk to somebody will be very different. All the thinking in the world can't formulate the right words and the right tone like feeling can, like the right emotion can. If you want to communicate at your optimum, forget the words and go to your feeling. Raise the feeling, and then you might be able to say just the right thing in the right way. This also applies when talking to yourself. You will now be talking to yourself in the right tone, in the right way, in a kindly way, in a balanced way. You'll be able to fix little faults and so forth without any aversion, and you'll have a loving ability to remodel. This is why metta is critical if you want to treat yourself well, and who doesn't? You must find your way to that balance and warmth of metta, including yourself in it. It doesn't mean you'll have no faults, nothing to fix. You'll have lots of things to fix, but you'll fix them in a beautiful way, with skill and without distress. About the author. Ajahn Sona is a first-wave Western Theravada-ordained monk and the abbot of Birkin Forest Buddhist Monastery, also known as Sitavana, located in British Columbia, Canada. After several years of practice as a lay hermit, the young Bhikkhu Sona took full monastic ordination in 1989 with Bhante Hanapola Gunaratana, Mahatera, at the first Theravada Forest Monastery in the United States, the Bhavana Society in West Virginia. He later switched affiliation to the Thai forest tradition and trained at Ajahn Chah's monasteries in northeastern Thailand for several years. Ajahn Sona now draws on both the Sri Lankan and Thai scholastic and meditative traditions in his teachings, in addition to his modern Western sensibilities. His pre-monastic education in philosophy, humanities, and classical Western music have aided him in understanding the Western psyche and in establishing paradigm bridges between East and West. Ajahn Sona is also deeply interested in the ecological movements of this environmentally critical time, both at the practical and philosophical levels. The off-grid monastery, which he has carefully curated over the last two decades, employs the latest in green design technologies and principles. Quote, the destination is gorgeous, end quote. Ajahn Sona. Thank you.